Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And then the lawless ones will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his comings. The coming of lawless ones is according to the work of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders, and with all the unrighteous deceptions among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions, and they should believe in lies. Morning. Our first song this morning will be We Will Glorify. I invite you to all join in. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, whom is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all. Next song this morning is going to be page 514, The Glory and Lamb Way. And after this, we'll ask Brother Greg Barrett to lead us in prayer. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way grows clear for I'm in the glory land way. Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land way. Rejoicing in his love, I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. 
I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear, for I'm in the glory land way. Next song this morning will be Standing on the Promises. I invite you to all stand. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. 
promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of Good to have everybody here this morning. Glad that you are. <coughs> and I had asked Ryan uh, ahead of time to see if we could find a picture of us worshiping here at Mount Zion. And uh, uh, I think he did pretty good, except the one that he's got right here. Um, I see a lot of them, Ryan, I can't help but think it, a lot of them are gone. And that's not that old a picture. But anyway, uh, it, uh, it's an old, it is it's got a little age on it. But I see some in there that I pretty well recognize. And, but, and Ellis is leading the singing, as you can see. And a lot of people we know in there, but a lot of them are gone, so it does change. Uh, but I couldn't think of a better picture to use than just us together, uh, worshiping here at Mount Zion. <clears throat> because we, uh, I think sometimes we feel kind of remote, uh, probably from Satan's agenda. Uh, and I hope that there's not any doubt in your mind uh, but what happened, but what Satan does have an agenda. Um, somebody uh, some years ago down in, I believe it was in South Carolina, came up with the idea uh, that God is dead. That's been several years ago, but that's, I remember when that happened. Some college professor, uh, he wasn't an atheist, he said, uh, he believed in God, but uh, uh, since then, God had died. Uh, and I thought, well, I don't see very much difference in that and then just going ahead and say, well, God never did exist to start with. But nevertheless, that was his take on it. Uh, and then we've got an element of people today that uh, they deny uh, that there is a Satan. Just flat out deny it. They believe in God, they say but there's no Satan. And I don't see that there's very much difference uh, in having that uh, in having that kind of an agenda because the Bible tells us that Satan is alive and well. And here, what we read in 2 Thessalonians uh, this morning uh, particularly says so, verse 9 says, Even him whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and so forth. Uh, and it identifies Satan in particular. And he does have an agenda. Uh, most of the time, we make our focus, I think, on God. And that's where our belief is. We don't pay too much attention to Satan as if Satan is dead. That Satan does not exist. But I assure you this morning, Satan is alive and well. I think we said that recently. Uh, and I want to continue that idea this morning. But you may be asking the question this morning, well, David, you're saying that Satan has an agenda. Just what is Satan's agenda? Now, I do have a few little points that uh, Ryan has put up there for us this morning. I hope none of them are appear to be complicated. I don't believe they are. I may have used some 50 cent words, but I think they're pretty simple. But to show you this morning that Satan has an agenda, I'd like to go before you go back, and anybody wants to go back with me, uh, may do that. Back to the book of Job. Back to the book of Job, chapters 1 and chapters 2. 
But I just want it firmly fixed in your mind about Satan's agenda. Satan does have one. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to read enough of you, enough of it, for you get the idea. Because verse six says, chapter one and verse six. <clears throat> now there was a day when the sons of God. And I'm reading out of King James version, of course. Sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord unto Satan. Notice that God addresses Satan rather than anybody else that came in this group. Nobody else is named. I don't know who the others were or what their names were, but I do know that Satan, Satan definitely seems to head the group. And God asked him this question. Uh, again, Old King James Version, I hope you're, if you've got a New King James or something, whence comest thou? Uh, and that would be the same equivalent today of saying, where you, where'd you come from? What are you doing? What are you up to? That's the question that's being asked. What are you about, Satan? Uh, and Satan reveals to God what his agenda is. <clears throat> and Satan answered the Lord, said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. That's my agenda. I'm everywhere. Satan, what's your agenda? I'm everywhere. Uh, I'm looking for people. That's my agenda. Uh, he says going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down in it. I'm, I'm all over the place. That's Satan's agenda. And another verse, I didn't write that one down. Another verse says, seeking whom I may devour. What does that mean? Satan says, I'm looking for people that I can eat alive. That's my agenda. Uh, that ought to scare us to death. Uh, rather than simply saying, well, I believe in God, and I believe God's alive, and I believe God is for us, and God's working in the world, but I, Satan, I don't know about. That ought to scare us to death. Satan is alive and well. He still dwells today, in earth, and he's still got an agenda today. And that ought to scare us because Satan is alive and well. I gave you my personal opinion a week or two ago I don't remember when it was or what the context was that I think that the coronavirus came from Satan I still believe that nobody has uh, showed me in a different way because Satan has got out of the coronavirus he's got everything out of it that he wanted think about it he don't want people to go to church hey it's stopping people from going to church in a lot of places we're talking to Beverly's sister yesterday in Chicago, just north of Chicago, and they're still not going to church. Here it is October and November, almost election day, and they are still not going to church. And you know Satan, that's on his agenda. All the places that you could go before and you can't go now, uh, it tickles him to death. Uh, Satan don't like for us to visit people in hospitals. Uh, I don't know how long it's been since I visited somebody in a hospital. As a preacher, I used to do quite a bit of that. Haven't been able to do it lately. Um, I would really like to see Mary Frances. Really like to see her. She's one of my favorite people in the world. But you know what Jerry and Ann's been telling me? They can only go see her for one hour, and both of them can't go then. He's on mother. Either he can go or Ann can go, but both of them can't go, can't get in. Ain't no use for me to go because they won't let me in. Many of you have had medical procedures. I can't come to the hospital and see you. And I know Satan, he, that's his agenda. He don't want me going over there. He don't want me to go to the hospital and see you. He don't want me to go to the nursing home. He, he don't want me to go anywhere and have anything to do with you. That's his agenda. And I got to thinking about, you know, this coronavirus, how many good things that Satan's got on that he wanted to stop and everything, and just about all of it's working for him. Just about all of it. I'll be so glad uh, when, we can, uh, when we can get away from this and get back to the old normal thing, but it's not on Satan's agenda to do that. And so I, I jotted down a few things. 
<clears throat> that I thought would be important for us today. It's Satan's agenda to trivialize attendance. Now, I'm wondering if you're like me. As we're sitting here and, and church is just beginning to start and whoever's got the uh, responsibility to put the numbers on the board, even though, uh, Gabe, you were already up there and you're ready to start leading the singing, uh, I can't hardly help it. I got to watch the guy that's putting this up here because I want to see how many he puts up there. Are you like that? Do you do you cut your eyes away from Gabe doing his job over here to Steve who's doing his job and say, I wonder how many we're going to have today. Obviously, we're not having as many people as we were before all this started. I'm happy for that number. Don't get me wrong. You're here and I'm happy that you're here. But I wish we could get back into the numbers that we had before all this started. Satan is tickled to death. And we've got a lot of people, I don't blame them a bit for not being here because they're scared of it. Uh, and you know, almost everything that we're here, especially if you're older, and we've got a lot of older members that are not able to be with us, uh, it's got to tickle him today. Ah, this is what he wanted trivialized church uh, you know what Satan has always done he's always told us <clears throat> you don't have to go to church it's not necessary for you to go to church Hebrews chapter 10 uh, verses 25 and 26 forget that uh, take your ink pen and mark through that you don't need to assemble you don't need to assemble you can be a Christian without assembling well it's been hard for us to assemble. It's been difficult for us to assemble. Uh, and a lot of people are still having a problem with that. And again, uh, that's a matter for one's own conscience about the assembling part of it as of right now. Uh, hopefully the day will come whenever God overturns that uh, and we go by God's agenda about assembling. I'd like to see us all come back together and assemble once again, but Satan trivializes attendance. He says it's really not that necessary. It tickles him to death. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, we find that the church is a place for saved people. Now, that the church is us, and we're the church seven days a week. But I like to put a little extra spin on that and think about coming to church on Sunday morning because a lot of people uh, have been encouraged by Satan not to go to church. church. He's saying church is a dangerous place to go. And we've been told, uh, wear your mask, keep your distance. We're trying to abide by all the, the health things. Uh, we don't want to get in trouble with the governor of the state of Kentucky or the science end of it and everything. We're doing the best that we can. You're doing that. But we're told, Satan tells us, it's a dangerous place to be. And it's not just dangerous in the physical way, it's dangerous in the spiritual way. You're going to find out things in church that you'd be better off not knowing. The church glorifies God, and Satan doesn't like that. The church preaches the gospel. Satan doesn't like that. That's not on his agenda. The church uh, doesn't give the devil much chance and he doesn't like that he likes to be in the limelight <coughs> so he trivializes church attendance another thing Satan got on his agenda is, is to criticize members criticize people there's nothing that really saddens us there's nothing that really hurts our feelings any worse uh, than for uh, our own members to be criticized uh, we don't personally like to be criticized. Nobody likes criticism. Nobody likes to be scolded. Uh, but we don't want our brothers and sisters criticized either. You start in talking about somebody at Mount Zion, uh, out in the world today, and when I'm talking to somebody and somebody brings up something negative about one of our church, church members, now that'll get me on you quicker than anything. 
I don't like for people to criticize Christians at Mount Zion. I don't like for them to criticize people in general or Christians. But boy, you say something about our members at Mount Zion, you'll have me to deal with for whatever it is. Criticizing members. Satan eats it up. That's his, that's his devouring philosophy. And when we do it worse than anybody else, how bad is it really? Satan is cheering because we're criticizing each other. And the Bible tells us that we've got a responsibility to exhort one another, to help one another, and not to criticize. But sometimes we criticize each other. Sometimes it's over the most trivial things. On Satan's agenda, uh, he minimizes respect. And we're living in a generation right now that a lot of people especially younger people are not being first of all taught respect and they are not living respectfully especially to those that are elders I'm talking about older people not church elders necessarily but older people Um, minimize respect and we might say well where did this come is that really Satan's agenda Um, I'd encourage um people to be respectful of the things that ought to be respected, the things that we've held dear for years. I don't believe it's been all that many years ago that if you saw somebody burn the flag, it would tear you all to pieces because of disrespect. Disrespect the flag of the United States of America and now we see it done all the time. We're not respectful of the flag the symbol of the United States of America. Where did that come from? Satan must be cheering. That is on his agenda is to minimize respect. To minimize uh, our people, the American people. To minimize what the government does for us. We've got a lot of complaints about that, but it's still our government. And worst of all, to minimize the respect that we have for God. And there are so many today that do not do that. We've taken God out of our schools. We've taken God out of our government. We've taken Him out of the workplace. We just don't respect God like we ought to respect Him. We do not hold His name there and that tickles Satan to death. It's on His agenda to disrespect God, to minimize uh, that respect. funny how that in just one person's lifetime like in my lifetime I have seen things change so much called me old fashioned I'll take that but I can remember when I would never hear a young person speak disrespectfully to an older person didn't have to be your mom and daddy it could be anybody that's an older person you spoke respectfully to them you spoke respectfully to your teachers for those that were over you. And I see a lot of it nowadays as if it doesn't really matter. Uh, maybe this is off on the fringe a little bit, but I can remember that if you had an aunt or an uncle, you called them aunt or uncle. <laughs> you know, we don't do that very much anymore. We just call them by their first name and go on. Uh, young people, be glad you're living in the generation that you're in or you didn't have my daddy for a daddy because he would have physically disciplined you for not being respectful to your aunts or your uncles in that time. And we've changed that. And it's almost everywhere. And we don't think very much about it anymore, but it's on Satan's agenda that we not be respectful. He minimizes respect today. On Satan's agenda... His agenda is to tell you to prioritize yourself. You are the most important person in your life. Doesn't make any difference about other people. You're here to serve yourself. Oh, how many times did Jesus uh, tell stories of um, parables about that attitude about uh, arrogance about self? Do you remember the story that he told about the so-called rich farmer, Luke chapter 12. 
Uh, and that farmer said to himself, I've had a good year. My crops have really done good this year. And he goes on to say, I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger barns. And he goes on to use a personal pronoun, a pro, personal what? Pronouns, thank you. Personal pronouns about 12 or 13 different times in that one little statement there. He prioritizes, prioritizes self. Uh, and Jesus teaches against that. And what Jesus teaches against, Satan teaches for. Now, if you don't believe that, go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Satan disguised himself as a serpent or a snake. Uh, and Satan comes to Eve and he said, What did God say about this tree? Uh, and Eve said, He said, Don't eat of it. The day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And you know what Satan's answer was? Thou shalt not truly die. You're not going to die if you eat of it. God, uh, he doesn't want you to. So Satan had an agenda there, and that was to prioritize self. Doesn't matter what God says or what God wants. You are the chief thing in your life. And so Satan uses that. The most important in, thing in your life is you. Satan's agenda is to exercise independence. Now these two, self and independence, they overlap an awful lot. But I thought they deserved two different places because in Satan's world, he says, it's the same as saying, you don't have to read the Bible, you don't have to study the Bible. It doesn't make any difference what God says. You're you and that's self, all right. But you need to be independent. And that's what he started with, with with man in the garden with Adam and Eve. He started preaching that message and that uh, giving us that agenda even back in those days. You can be independent. And he even went so far as to say, the reason that God doesn't want you to do this, to eat of that tree, he knows this tree will make you smart like him and he don't want you to be smart like him. He's God. Uh, and it'll make you like he is, and he doesn't want that. God's selfish, and that's still on Satan's agenda today. Be independent. Think the way that you want to. It comes that way a lot of times to church teaching even today. Uh, people reject church doctrine, church teaching that comes from the Bible itself, and people are encouraged by Satan himself because it's agenda for us to exercise independence. It doesn't make any difference what other people do. You do what you want to do and when you want to do it and how you want to do it. And so it happens in that way. Exercise independence. And then last of all, and I've saved this one right here. Sometimes we say I've saved the best for the last. I don't know that this is the best, but it's very, very important. And that is that on Satan's agenda, uh, it is to politicize morality. Politicize it? Well, you can't just stand on every street corner and preach against morality, uh, but you can stand with a microphone in your hand. You can get on national television. You can put it in the papers about morality, and you can politicize it from, from that angle. And I want to discuss with you for just a moment some of those things that we find today that are being passed off as politics, but they're really moral things. Uh, and we're forced, it seems, to be on one side or the other uh, of this morality fence when we ought not to be, and it tickles Satan to death. It tickles him to death. And that is his agenda. Homosexuality is not just a political agenda, it's moral. And the Bible has plenty to say about it. When, if you need more uh, Bible verses for it, let me know and I'll give them to you. Old Testament and New. Abortion. That is a big issue in our time. People say, well that's a political thing. The Bible teaches us that it's a moral 
It's a, a, a part of the moral agenda. It's on Satan's agenda. And the list goes on and on and on. I've got a bunch of them right here that I've got written down. Abortion, gambling. The Bible teaches us that gambling is not a good thing. It's not a good Christian virtue. Uh, but it's a, it's a moral agenda so far as on the moral journey, so far as the world is concerned today. Uh, and I think about many other subjects that we have been forced to to accept as political when they're really moral. And those things, they say, you ought to talk about those things from the pulpit because they're political issues. I talk about them because they are moral issues. They've been moral issues for 2,000 years uh, at least. And, and they're not going away anyway soon. It's the devil's agenda to, uh, agenda to keep them alive. If you don't think the devil's real and you don't think that he's got an agenda, you better go back and read the Bible. He's alive and well and he's got plenty to tell you about. Some of them sounds pretty good when you first hear them. But he's not for you. He will eat you alive. That's his business is to devour you. It is his business to go up and down the earth and so when God asks that question, where would you come from, Satan? What are you doing? And Satan tells him his agenda. He hadn't changed that agenda for all these years. He's still out to get you. And he's still alive and well, and he's still working on it, and he's having a lot of success. Don't let him get you. You have Jesus Christ. You have God your Father. And they are willing to save your soul. Stay away from Satan, but believe he is real. Satan is real and he has an agenda. Are you here this morning outside of Christ? Is there something that we can do in order to help you? If you are not God's, you are Satan's. That ought to scare you to death. I hope it does. Will you come this morning while we stand, Gabe? And while we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam, farther and farther away? Calling today. Calling is tenderly calling today. Jesus is falling the weary to rest. Calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away. Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today, Jesus is pleading, oh this to his voice, hear him today. Hear him today. They who believe in his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and away. Calling today. Calling today. Jesus is calling. Calling today. Prepare minds for the Lord's Supper. We'll see in the verse, first verse, page 159. I gave my life for thee.
my precious blood I shed, that thou my ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? As we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, as always, we'd like to ask you to uh, concentrate on the events that led up to Jesus' death. And uh, we're going to have a couple of verses here to, to kind of help us do that. But uh, I ask you to just kind of be in the right frame of mind for this. This is one of the reasons that they came together. It said in, on one occasion, they came together upon the first day of the week to break bread. And we're here to do that this morning. Um, I'll begin to read from John chapter 6 in verse 48 beginning it says I am the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die I am the living bread which came down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather here today in freedom that we can come together to praise your name. Father, that we can come together to participate in this communion and remember the, the, the sacrifice and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Fathers, we partake of this bread, which represents Jesus' body, the bread of life. Father, we pray that we'll partake of it in a way that pleases you and remembering his sacrifice and the gift of his very flesh that he gave to give us life. Father, thank you for Jesus. Forgive us of our sins and in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, John writes, Grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the, over the kings of the earth, to Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. Uh, Dad had a lesson recently, uh, fairly recently, about how things that you you wouldn't think that would be that way, and one of the things that he mentioned was, and I thought it was very telling, was that um, in, in this world, if I get blood on me, that's a stain, and that's a stain that that makes me dirty. Uh, but in this case, we see that Jesus has blood that, when applied to us, washes us. Actually, the exact opposite of what you might think. The blood of Jesus Christ applied to us cleanses us. It washes us from our sin. This fruit of the vine is a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus that He gave to wash away our sins. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for Jesus. 
We're thankful for all that you do for us, but most especially, Father, for the gift of Jesus that he came to this world to live, to give us an example of how to live. And then, Father, that he, uh, that he was slain for our sins, not for sin of his own, for he had none, but, Father, that, that we might become his righteousness and we might become the, your righteousness in him. Father, we pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' shed blood, we pray that we'll do so in a manner that pleases you. And that we're, we acknowledge the sacrifice of Jesus' blood that took away his life, but that gives us life. Thank you for Jesus, and in Jesus' name, amen. We also take this opportunity as a convenience because we're kind of already up here to remind you that uh, one of our responsibilities is to give back uh, for those who are in need to give back to the Lord and uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that we come here. One of the things that we're commanded to do, I just want to remind you that there are boxes in the back that have been set up and places for you to, to, uh, to drop off your particular offering if you haven't already done so. Uh, and also there are electronic ways that uh, Vimeo, I think is one, if I'm saying that right, I may be mispronouncing that, I don't know. But Venmo, Venmo, thank you for straightening me out on that. There are electronic means that you can do, but uh, there are also ways in the back that you can drop that off. And uh, we'd like to uh, offer thanks for that as well this time. Let's pray. Father, you do so much for us in our lives. Uh, even as we look out and we see uh, the people who are struggling uh, during this pandemic because of being out of work, Father, uh, we praise you that you sustain us even still, that even through the harshest of times you've sustained us and cared for us and provided for us. And Father, today we pray that you will bless the offering that we give back to you. Father, we pray you help us to do so freely and with cheer. And Father, we pray that you will uh, bless the work that this, this money will help to do, that the, you'll, you'll use it and it will use it to advance the church and that many people may be saved because of it. Uh, Father, please forgive us of our sins and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll close this morning with the first and last verse, page 228. And after the song, the last Jerry Willis lead us in our closing prayer. I invite you to all stand. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of life if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads on. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads on. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in it nevermore. For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home, where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Father, we come to you for 